Okay, so tonight we have uh, uh, two pillars, uh, call to family, community and participation, and pillar three, rights and responsibilities. As I said last week, um, uh, each of these could be um, many nights long. Uh, so we're just scratching the surface and I'm compiling a list of resources to give you at the end uh, that you can go and do some more reading. I should have mentioned uh, we have our seminarian with us. Uh, Mike is uh, now is in his third year, looking forward to diaconate ordination, and he also has a class on Catholic social teaching uh, this year at the seminary, so he's stealing all of my materials uh, <laughs> so he doesn't have to read and sign. Okay. So we'll see how this goes. So let's let's uh, do a little review from night one, especially if you weren't here. So the ch church's social teaching, it's a body of doctrine. It's, it's how the church interprets how we are to respond to the world. Obviously, it's all guided by the Holy Spirit and in light of what has been revealed to us by Jesus. And the social teaching consists mainly with documents from the popes, but also from some things from Second Vatican Council, things from conferences of bishops, uh, just trying to uh, express how the Catholic should be living his or her faith in uh, our society. Um, so last week we did the, the introduction and the life and dignity of the human person. So again, we start right from the basics uh, of scripture in the book of Genesis. Each of us is made in the image and likeness of God. You'll see this come up in almost every pillar. Uh, and then also responsible for the care of each other, especially the most vulnerable. We see that especially in the Old Testament prophets, right? The prophets came because people weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And so an example of this is Jeremiah, who says, do what's right and just, rescue the victims, do no wrong to the alien, the orphan, or the widow, right? Those were three large categories of vulnerable people in uh, ancient Israel. So. Um, and then, of course, we go to the New Testament, and we have uh, the Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan, that we know, we see what it's like uh, to be a neighbor. And Jesus says, well, then go and do it, right? Go and do likewise. And then we also have the uh, reading from Matthew's Gospel at the end, the Judgment of the Nations, where he says, you know, you fed me, you saw me when I was hungry, thirsty, uh, homeless, sick, in prison. You cared for me. What? We didn't see that. As long as you did it for the least of me, of my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's our, that's our call. And then for Vatican II, uh, we have um, an obligation as human beings uh, to respond to the needs of our neighbor without exception. Right? Especially the most vulnerable. So that, then we, um, we reviewed some of the uh, uh, crimes against the human person, right? Uh, abortion, uh, euthanasia, assisted suicide, we looked at capital punishment. Um, and of course there's other ones, human trafficking, victims of human trafficking, uh, other forms of slavery, all those uh, areas of people living in squalid conditions, all those attacks against the human person. <coughs> so there was one question I think someone asked after, and it came up uh, uh, at the evening session. It was about um, care that people are required to have at the end of life. Right. So there's always a question, well, if I don't do this procedure, or I don't do this uh, particular medicine or I don't take chemo or radiation uh, and I die, am I killing myself? Am I committing suicide, right? So always great, and I, uh, there's a lot of consternation about that uh, with folks. And the rule is uh, there's ordinary care. We have to take fluids, we have to take food, you know, we have to take biot antibiotics if this is the normal course of things. But we're not required to undergo extraordinary care. You know, if I'm 90 years old and the doctor says, well, you got congestive heart failure, uh, you don't have to have open heart surgery, right? Uh, if you have, like my mom, she had chemo, she had radiation, wasn't working, finally she just said, I'm done, right? I'm done. 
right? Let's let this take its course, right? I prefer to have a few good months uh, rather than extra months, you know, throwing up and being nauseous and all that. That's extraordinary care. Uh, so <coughs> the best thing to do if you have a question about that is you can call me, and I usually call the experts, uh, moral theologians and other people, but we get this about kidney dialysis. Look, at I'm, I've been doing this five days a week for five years, and the doctor says I'm dying anyway, so I have to keep going, right? You know, depending on the circumstances, probably not. Right? Probably not. But uh, you're certainly not... Um, uh, if you do it, that's great if you, if you want to do it. But if, if you come to the decision and your doctor says, look, at you're not getting any better, um, and there's really no um, possibility of you getting any better, and uh, this is causing a great um, hardship to you, and it's, uh, then you could say, you know what, this seems to be extraordinary care, right? So that's a, it's a, a reflection that we do uh, just to see whether it's ordinary care or extraordinary care, and then you make the decision, right along with your family. Uh, life is great, life is precious, but this isn't the only, this isn't the end all, right? We're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, and so uh, we don't have to go to extraordinary lengths uh, to preserve our life. Okay, so that was a question left over from last week. Any other questions from night one before I? Uh, Turn to night two. Yes. Um, when we were talking last week, you were talking about um, intentional murder, and then we were talking about physician-assisted suicide. Right. Why are the doctors that are prescribing those medications that are going to produce death? Why is that not intentional murder, and why is that not being prosecuted? Well, there are states where it's legal. Right, there's 89 states where it's legal in the District of Columbia uh, where it's perfectly legal for doctors to do that. Right. So um, uh, that's why they're not being prosecuted. It's interesting that when they list the, say the person has cancer and they give them those medicines in several of the states that I've read their statutes, the cause of death is listed as cancer. Well, it wasn't cancer that killed them, right? Mm -hmm. It was the drugs that killed them. Uh, but they do it uh, because they are uh, authorized to do it. <coughs> okay. That's so scary. Yep, it's very scary. Okay, no other questions from uh, Dignity of the Human Person? All right, good, got a very good class. <laughs> <laughs> the night people might have more questions, right? All right. So, uh, let me go back here. Let me not go back. Um, so, call to family, community, and participation. Okay? So, from scripture, uh, we get God is love. Right? That means, uh, in the letter of St. John, first letter of St. John, God is love. Okay? We've also been, it's been revealed to us that God is a community of persons or a communion of persons. Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, the love between Father and Son is another person, right? It's the Holy Spirit. We sometimes envision that. And we're made in God's image and likeness, right? Ergo, therefore, what? Therefore, well, we can't do this. <laughs> therefore, <laughs> we are people of communion, or meant to be, and we are made for, for love. Right, and the love. Um, so I use this at weddings often, right, because they always pick, most people or a lot of people pick the book of Genesis for their first reading. God says they made man and woman. And um, that's why the father, the husband leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh, right? So I picture the scene, right, in the garden, Adam's. Um, Adam is created by God, right? And God says, or we read that it's not good for the man to be alone. Right? So God 
brings all these animals to birds to Adam and gives them a name. Adam gives them names, but this is known to the suitable partner, so he puts the man uh, in a deep sleep and raises up woman. And I say, you know, Adam wakes up, right, and he sees Eve. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. This one, at last, is born of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Right? This one, right? This is the partner for me. Right? And from the partnership uh, becomes, becomes family. Right? So this is the foundation of uh, our society, the foundation of our church. So... Uh, Citing a lot from Gaudium et Spes, again from the Second Vatican Council, the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. This is um, the Church's attempt to engage how human beings should uh, participate in the life of the world. Right, and in this one, it says the well being of the individual person, of human and Christian society, is intimately linked with the healthy condition of that community produced by marriage and the family. So, to prepare for this, we are going to attempt something that's rarely been attempted before. Why is everyone giggling at me? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to show the video on this. Okay? Here we go. Okay, this worked earlier. God created us as people to be sacred, to worship okay. him, but also to be social beings, to love and to live in community. Get ready to hold on to that. Family is really the first form of communication. It's really the first place that we learn to love, to be loved, to give of ourselves. You know, you practice, you practice, you practice, and it just doesn't happen. All right, we'll get back to that. There it goes. Well, no, was it there? Mm -hmm. It was for a moment. Oh. So it's, it, the, the council, the Vatican Council saw the, the church or saw the family as this place where multiple generations could come together, right? The old would pass on their wisdom uh, to parents and grandparents or godparents or grandchildren and families would take care of, of the elderly uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute but it's the foundation of the church it's the foundation of society uh, so mainly this bottom line or this last line the family is motivated by the mutual love of the spouses by their fruitfulness meaning the way that they share their love, their solidarity and faithfulness, and by their loving. So everybody helps uh, one another. That's the way the church sees the family working. And of course, if we have a breakdown in the family, there's usually a breakdown in society, right? We'll hear that in, in, the, uh, in the video. So Christians, um, we're, our job uh, according to the Gaudium et Spes and in other, this document and other documents, uh, we should promote the value of marriage and of the family by living good lives, holy lives, but also by cooperating with other people to um, advance uh, the family and advance uh, marriage and family life. Um, Pope uh, Francis said something about this recently. Uh, I'll hit the highlights here. You know, We've got this great world that's been given to us by God and, uh, and this human family that, with whom we share the, the planet. And so it's our common home, he uses that a lot. And we're all here as brothers and sisters. So uh, if the just ordering of society and of the state is a central responsibility of politics, right? we can't just stay on the sidelines. We gotta be involved because this is the work that God has given to us to be concerned about the human person and about fighting for justice. We heard that from the prophets so often in the Old Testament. So in faithful citizenship, we hear from the American bishops every four years. They, they uh, 
prepare a document for us in preparation for the presidential elections. Um, we're called to contribute to greater justice and peace, not just for Catholics, right? But for all people. Our job is to be involved. Uh, the church's obligation to participate in the, in, the, in the public square, right? This is what Jesus gives to us. We are supposed to care for one another, and that's politics, really, <laughs> how it comes about uh, or can come about. So uh, this great uh, number 22 from Gaudium, it spans paragraph number two. Christ takes flesh, right? And he reveals to us what it means to be human, right? I love that that line, if we want to know what it means to be human, we have to look to Christ. He offers us the fullness of, of what it means. All of us are certainly human, but we're marred by sin, the original sin, and any sin that hits us. But Christ himself is perfect. He's the, he's the face of the Father. And so he shows us what it truly means uh, to be human. And so we have to bring that into the world. Um, So at the middle of this, at the center of all of our projects, uh, the truth of the human person, of the family, of the dignity of the human person, that's right at the core of it, right? That's the, as it says, the faithful citizen reminds us, uh, the dignity of the human person is at the center of, of our moral and social teaching. And we know this all from faith and reason. We can figure this out. And so we need, as the bishops say, we have to bring this a concern and this truth about human life and the dignity of the person into the public square. All right. I love this from the Pope Francis, right? Participation in the political life, it's a moral obligation. You know, sometimes I'll preach a homily on something that touches on something in the news. People will say, Father, stay out of politics. <laughs> right, that's I always have to, every once in a while ago, this is not a political homily, <laughs> right? This is about the gospel, right? Uh, because the gospel, uh, Jesus, uh, politics is about the concern of the human person, right? And how we order ourselves and how we exist as a society. Well, that's the interest of the church as well. And so the church uh, has to be, and every Catholic has to be participate in the life of uh, society, in, in the political system. So, um, as, as he says at the end, um, as far as possible, we should take an active part in public life. And that means more than just voting, right? It means calling up our legislators. It means visiting people. It means writing letters. It means protesting. It means all sorts of different things, depending on your state in life. But we should all be involved in um, uh, in the um, political arena. Um, family, community participation, right? It begins, once again, with the human person made in the image and likeness of God, right? It all, everything flows from that. And not only that, we're made for the other, right? Uh, all the popes have talked about, especially John Paul, that our bodies say something about who we are that uh, we're, we're incomplete as far as passing on life. We need the other, right? And so we're comp we complement, male and female complement each other in the passing on of life. And that's the, um, the family is the, uh, the basic building block, as it were, of family, uh, of society, and of the church. And that is meant to reflect a God and the Holy Spirit, a God to the, to the world, right? Who did I say? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A communion of love. That's who the family is meant to be. Right? And they're supposed to then go and serve. Uh, it's a vocation of service and communion. So, uh, again, it starts with the human person to the family. And we have a role to support. We have a duty to support the human family and marriage. And then um, the family... Um, forms the children into who they're called to be, what their destiny is. We're going to see this in just a minute in rights and responsibilities. Um, and then the children through the family, through grandma and grandpa, if they're blessed enough to, to know them, 
they uh, get to know their, they learn their vocation, right? They imitate uh, uh, their parents by going out then to serve uh, the church and, and the society. Um, so we're called then, um, especially the book bishops talk about in uh, faithful citizenship, we're supposed to be engaged in the human project, right? So we need to be down there at City Hall with our pitchforks <laughs> and torches. Um, we need to engage our political leaders. We need to uh, vote. We need to uh, do other ways that we can engage the, uh, the, the common good. Okay? So that's the first, uh, that's what it means to be uh, Catholic, Catholic social teaching. It has to affirm the family because that's where it springs from. Right? Mm -hmm. Questions about that? Father, I think we're in such a contentious political environment right now. This is really difficult to do. What's that? Engage the, engage yes. the political system? Yes. That's exactly why we need to be engaged, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. We have to bring, um, it, it, you know, a lot of politics is us versus them, where there's, it's, yes. it, it's, there's no, they're all winners or losers. There's no compromise. There's no, uh, oftentimes it's about right. power and not about the dignity of the human person. It's about winning, right? right? And mm -hmm. so who gets lost in that? Usually it's the most vulnerable are gonna get lost uh, in the shuffle. Um, but yeah, that's the, the fact that it is contentious uh, is the exact reason why the Christian needs to be involved to bring these, these ideas, these truths about the human person and what the dignity of the human person is and what the end of the, tr the human person is, and what it means uh, to be in cooperation with one another, to build a common good. That's exactly why the Christian needs to be involved in the process, right? Um, otherwise, it becomes very Hobbesian, very just, you know, winner takes all. It's uh, whoever's the strongest wins, right? That's not what God desires for us, right? Yeah. That's not what God desires. That's not a, a good, <coughs> flourishing uh, public. Uh, public, yeah. Other questions about the family? Yeah. Father, can you address the issue of same-sex marriage and um, people? You know, say for example, the baker who didn't want to bake a cake. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, He's a lawyer too, so. Uh, so let's let's um, so same, the question is same sex uh, same sex people. We'll, we'll say that, okay? So the, the, we again start with what the fundamental, right? The dignity of the human person. Every person, regardless of who you are and who you like and who you love, uh, every person has dignity. Right? We have to start right there. And there can be no discrimination against people because of uh, race, uh, uh, sex, all that stuff, including uh, uh, big, uh, sexual, sexual orientation. Okay? Um, so we start with that. So we start with that fundamental principle, right? Mm -hmm. The person is made in the image and likeness of God. Okay. Then um, the question becomes, what do we do with our gift of, of sexuality, right? Um, and there the church would say, regardless of, of, of uh, who the other is, there shouldn't be any sexual activity outside of yeah. marriage, right? Marriage is designed by God uh, for the unity of the spouses and for a uh, new life, right? Only the union of husband and wife, male and female, can produce new life. So the church would say any other uh, uh, union would not be marriage as, as the church understands it. Okay. Now, um, as to these um, cases that are springing up, we've had a florist, I think. We've had a, a cake 
person. We've got some videographers. Um, the basic legal argument is that I, um, I create, say, say I'm a videographer. I'm Daryl Mortek. No, I won't use you. I'm Ralph Talbot. I'm a videographer. And I'll do video, video, uh, videos of everybody, right? Uh, that meet, that, that don't uh, go against my deeply held religious beliefs. Judy and uh, Jane call and say, we want you to film our wedding. And I, videographer, say, well, no, I won't, because my deeply held belief is in Christian marriage, male and female. So the argument is, can, can Jane and Judy compel me to produce something I don't want to produce, right? The other one is, the, from Jane and Judy's side is, well, you're a market, you're um, uh, serving the public, and so you have to serve everybody who comes to you, right? Uh, so far, the cases have been that no, you can't compel me to um, go against my deeply reli uh, held religious beliefs. This is a violation of my religious freedom. That's how the case has been going so far. Uh, with this Supreme Court, I would think that they would continue in that trajectory. You know, most of these places, there's other videographers and there's other cake makers and there's other florists, and so, uh, I don't know how much that has weighed in the court's decision, but uh, their basic premise is, if, if I'm a Catholic, uh, I can't be compelled to go against my deeply held beliefs and produce, uh, and produce something that goes against my, my religious freedom. That's the way the cases have gone. There's one in Minnesota, I think it's a videographer. I think they're gonna take to federal court now, so. The cases continue. You again. This here's this tension that we have. Okay, the law says you have to. You ha, you can't discriminate, right? You have to treat all people. Uh, you can't discriminate based on race, sex, creed, uh, color, sexual orientation. Okay, how do how do we how do we have that right to not be discriminated against? And my First Amendment right uh, of freedom of religion. So these two are, are pounding against each other, mm -hmm. right? And so far the court has said uh, the First Amendment, the freedom of religion, um, if you're gonna really believe that, then you have to honor that person's uh, belief in marriage and not compel them to make something for that wedding, okay? So these cases I think are gonna come, continue to come forward until the Supreme Court really speaks clearly uh, on that issue. Did I get the premise right? Yeah, and I would say, I mean, so one dimension is it's not just the serving a, a, a gay couple in their marriage, it's that sort of element of creative expression that when you're making a wedding cake, you're decorating it uh, for the purpose of celebrating that marriage. If, if it were a case about the caterer, that the guy doesn't want to serve mashed potatoes and meat, uh, for an event, that probably would have gone the other way. But because there's that element, that personal element that would go against the, the deeply held religious belief, um, that's why those cases have been going uh, in favor of the protection of religion. And, and you have your compelling speech that goes against that. God created us as people to be sacred, to worship Him, but also to be social beings, to love and to live in community and care for one another. Family is really the first school of communications. It's really the first place that we learn to love, to be loved, to give of ourselves, so that we're prepared to go out into a community and to serve other people. I see families and their role as central to the life of society. We're, we're nurtured in family, we come to birth in family, we find our purpose in family. Society really begins with marriage and family. If family is broken, if marriage is broken, if our relationships there at the most basic level are broken, society really can't function as it should at the service of others, with love for others, with compassion for others. Community is rooted in our faith. From the very beginning, 
God himself who is community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the core of the universe is a relationship. It makes perfect sense that we as human beings were made to live in relationships rooted in love. As parishes, we're called to engage in the community in which we live. Uh, we're not supposed to be bystanders or mere observers, but instead we're supposed to get in there and, and live and listen and love the people that, that God has placed around us. Most of us are not happy to simply be acted on. We want to act for ourselves, we want to act for others. And so participation isn't just saying you get to vote, although it includes that. It's saying we will equip you, we will give you access to the resources and the opportunity you need so that not only can you occasionally say something, but that you can come in and have an impact in a situation. Within our family, we've really tried to emphasize our own little domestic church as part of the broader church. It means taking what we learn as people of faith and then putting it into practice, going out into community and being Christ's hands and feet to those people that we see that are in need. Subsidiarity is one of those great Catholic words. It comes from the root subsidium, help. Subsidiarity is allowing the different levels of society to do the job for which they were made. It doesn't mean that occasionally, when those institutions can't do their job, that they get help from larger institutions. But fundamentally, it's a recognition that society is an organic reality with different levels of authority, from the individual to the nuclear family to the government, the church, that all of these have a role to play in making a healthy life together for all of us. We can appreciate how we have to be involved at different levels responding to different needs. Not experts coming from the outside, but neighbors helping one another. At the heart of reality, we're all made social beings. There's a modern myth that says we're all just autonomous individuals. It's just not how we experience life. Who of us would want to live without friendship? That's the fullness of who we are, because it's in relationship we can live love. And when we live love, then we have the joy of the gospel. I used the word subsidiarity, which I, I didn't use. So it's, it's basically saying we want the person or organization closest to the issue to make the decision. So um, garbage collection. The, the federal government could definitely be involved in it, right? But they're probably not the best. Or the state government could be involved in it, right? Or county government could be involved in it. But usually it's the city who wants to pick up your garbage, right? right? That's their people local, they're closest to the situation. Um, uh, or what you're gonna name a ballpark or something like that. But we don't need the federal government to step in. This is a decision that should be um, uh, done at the local level, right? School board, what curriculum people use. That should be done at the local level, right? And then beyond that, family, right? Where your child goes to school. Well, that's not a decision for the state, really. Uh, that's a, not, not really. It's not a decision for the states, right? It's a decision for the state that they want your, that they command your child to go. But where your child goes, that's up to you, right? That's the, the parents are the first teachers of their children especially in areas of religion, but also in education. So you can send them to charter school, or you can send them to the public school, you can send them here to Frasati, or you can homeschool them, right? So the issue of subsidiarity is that that's a decision that should be made in the home. So uh, it's a, it is a great Catholic term. So questions on the video or on this, on this first section, we're gonna see some overlap in the next section of rights and responsibilities, especially around political action and uh, uh, participation. Any questions about that? With Justin here, I'm gonna roll the second <laughs> video before uh, on rights and responsibilities.
Our human rights come out of human dignity. We are made in the image and likeness of God. That's where the dignity of the human person comes from. We all have a right to have a decent livelihood, but at the same time we have a responsibility to contribute to society, to the common good. The basic human rights in Catholic social teaching are most succinctly expressed in the papal encyclical Pacem in Terris. And there, the foundation is the basic right to life that cannot be taken away. We require life in order to have all of our other rights uh, and in order to fulfill all our other responsibilities. We are required to have more than existence. Jesus promises us the abundant life. Building on that basic right are all the super basic things that each of us need, like food and water and shelter and clothing. Healthcare is another area where people have rights to medical procedures and, and medicine and uh, the care of a doctor. On top of the foundation of those sort of basic rights for survival, there are more sophisticated rights, like the right to participate in society. A right to have a search for God in freedom of religion, to search for truth and to live in integrity with that, respected. For us, rights and responsibilities are reciprocal. We always have a, a responsibility to others, to the common good, and to, to see our work and resources as something that need to be used to build up uh, society and to to be shared with those who are in need. That need is a call. It calls something out from us. What do we encounter in the communities where we are, our kids' school, our neighborhood, our parish? And then in a larger sense, uh, what are the needs in our region? Human beings are wonderful creatures that have rights, but also that have agency and responsibility to help to shape their own destiny and the destinies of others in ways that reflect this basic dignity that God has given us. So advocacy is a really important way for us as Catholics to participate in the ordering of society. It's a way for us to ask the government to structure laws, procedures, policies in such a way that people are better able to attain their human rights and exercise their responsibilities. We are born with others given to us to look after us, but then with our responsibility to look after others. It's huge. We are really supposed to think when we meet others, and they're supposed to think when they meet us. Here is another person in God's image. Here is a person just like me. Okay, rights and responsibilities. Any questions on pillar two? Okay, pillar three. Um, one of the speakers there talked about Pachim and Terrace. This is the encyclical of Pope John the 23rd, whose feast day we celebrate this week on Friday. Uh, he wrote this in 1963, shortly before he, after the calling of the Second Vatican Council, shortly before he, uh, before he died. And um, really can't see those. I know I forgot to do that. Uh, enlarge that one. Um, it, it basically says towards the bottom: every human person has rights and duties. He's endowed with intelligence and free will. He has rights and duties, which which flow from who we are as human beings. And those rights are universal and inviolable, meaning no one can take them away and therefore, together, uh, inalienable. So, um, that's just from the level of nature, right? But then we realize that from a level of grace, uh, we've been um, ransomed or uh, redeemed by Christ. And so now, we're more than just social animals. We're redeemed human beings. So we're made in the image and likeness of God and redeemed. And we're heirs to eternal glory with God. So now our status uh, is elevated. So, um, 
Pope John the 23rd listed a bunch of rights and I just want to go through and maybe uh, if you see one that we're missing that the Pope is missing uh, uh, we can add it at the end okay so we have the right to live and as they said that includes food and clothing and shelter and medical care and rest social services a doctor health care ill health he has the right to um, care if he's disabled or she's disabled, uh, widowed, uh, when he's deprived of means of his livelihood. We go to places like Haiti and we see uh, uh, food, right? Um, not always. The kids that come to our school in um, Marfrog, they usually don't have anything to eat or very small maybe a soup before they walk to the class, to the school, that could be many miles for some of them. And then, um, you know, it's not like here they have a hot lunch program. Uh, we do, I mean, they don't normally, but we provide it so that they can have a, a good meal at home or at school. And then they go home and they may or may not get uh, food there. Um, shelter, I've shown you pictures of what shelter looks like. It's oftentimes it's a, a tin, in shack. Uh, medical care, often especially in the hills or the mountains, uh, they don't see doctors. And a friend of mine went, she's a dentist, most of her time was spent pulling teeth, right? Rotten teeth because there's no a dental care. Um, and, you know, if they get sick in old age, they dump them at the door, usually of the sisters, right? Because they know they're going to get good care there and their family won't, won't or can't care for them. You know, we, we support, uh, every once in a while we'll send a check to some Korean nuns who handle those who are uh, mentally disabled, the missionaries of the poor, the severely, severely uh, disabled uh, adults. Uh, no one's gonna care for them in Haiti, right? Many times the sisters find these people along the road and they'll just pick them up and say, would you like to come with us, right? Uh, uh, the government is just not, uh, that's not their structure. So um, I would say the people in Haiti uh, are lacking in many of these fundamental rights. John the 23rd says we have a right to be, whenever he says man, I know we got into this last week, he means the human person, right? Every human person, every human being has a right to be respected, right? A right to his good name. How about this last one? He has the right to be accurately informed about public events. No false news, big news. Uh, we have a right to know what's going on in the world, uh, to be told the truth. Yeah, that's right. yep, that's gonna come on the other side. Yeah, these are just the rights. We're gonna turn, we're gonna go list the rights and then we're gonna like, list the responsibilities, okay? So, the benefits of culture and to get a good education and training. Uh, people have a right to, to get these out. Of course, uh, as we'll see, they have a duty. They can't, it's just all not handed to them. One of the things we've found in Haiti, uh, the last thing we want to do is, is create a begging culture, right, where they expect us to give them everything. Our, our uh, that was one of the hard lessons I learned last time where it's, it's it's very tempting to just say here, right? But when you say here, that here is gone, and then they need another person to come in behind him. What we've tried to do is uh, education. That's why we've really focused on education, where the children can grow up learning and be um, make changes in their society, right? And um, we don't want uh, to just give them things. We want them to, um, because that takes away their dignity, right? We want to build up their dignity. Um, okay, the right to worship according to one's conscience, we heard that. Uh, if we believe that God uh, gave us everything and that we're destined for God, well then we should have a right uh, to worship God as we see fit. We should have the freedom, the right to choose our state in life, whether it's a marriage, priesthood, religious life. 
And then here's that line about it's the support and education of children is a right which belongs primarily to the parents. There's that subsidiarity. He has a right to work. Uh, he has a right to um, a wage that's uh, that's just. Uh, it's got to be proportionate. He says be sufficient to allow him and his family a standard of living consistent with human dignity. Where we see uh, today a lot of talk about a living wage or. Uh, a lot of discussion about that. So it's a still ongoing, even if it's 50 years later. Here is uh, ownership of private property was something that was first talked about by the Pope in that first encyclical we talked about last week, Rerum Navarro, back in the, 18, uh, the 19th century. Uh, private property was uh, uh, first discussed in that encyclical that it's OK to have uh, a private property. In fact, it's a good. Again, this is going to call into, um, it's going to force us to use our, to use our, our private property responsibly, right? Uh, so there's a social obligation even though it's, it's private property. That we can meet together and form associations, we can be in the Lions Club, we can be in the, uh, uh, Lions Club again, <laughs> the Knights of Columbus, whatever you want to do. Some of these, many of these organizations have a right or have a, an important role to play in the society and to fulfill the rights of, of people. Uh, here's one we see in immigration issues a lot, right? I talked about the five uh, principles of, of Catholic social teaching on immigration. One, we have a duty, the person has a duty uh, to stay in their country. Right, and to work and to find uh, work that allows them to support their family. Right, that's the first uh, thing of, of social teaching on immigration. Person has a right just to stay put. Right, but if they can't support their family or they can't do it in safety, then they have a right to emigrate to leave their country. Right. Um, a third principle is that. Um, um, Countries have a right to uh, protect their borders, right? They don't have to let everyone in who comes to their nation. They have a right to vet who comes in. Uh, the fourth uh, social uh, teaching is that refugees, pe people fleeing, especially from violence and persecution, uh, that the country to which they appear uh, should give them special consideration. And then um, fifth, that all people, regardless of whether you're accepted or not accepted, documented, undocumented, refugee, whatever your status is, that every person is treated with dignity. Why? Because we're all made in the image and likeness of God. Right? It goes back to that fundamental principle. So here, Pope John the Twenty-Third talks about the right to emigrate, emigrate, and to immigrate. Here, um, well, I don't know why I ran out of uh, time to um, enlarge these, but that we have a right to uh, be involved in the public square and um, that we are entitled to legal protection of all these rights that we're talking about. Everybody gets these rights, right? It comes from God and for the natural law. So all of these laws are um, belong to each person. Okay, and then we have to, there's a reciprocity. We have to respect those duties and rights in the other person, right? We love to have the freedom of speech. Boy, can we hate it when somebody uses their freedom of speech, <laughs> right? Shut up, I'm speaking, right? Um, no, we love to be able to talk but when somebody says something that's contrary to us, we can be quick to um, maybe want to shut them down, right? And that's, uh, here we see this, there has to be a reciprocity of rights and duties between people. 
and we have to work together to make sure that if we respect each other's rights, this builds uh, the common good. It, it, it builds up a civic order where everybody observes these things. That's the goal. So these were just about the human person. I'm going to talk about the family. Anything that you saw there, or hey, John the 23rd missed that. I know he's a saint, but he missed something. Well, he found the implied everything. Yeah. Well, sometimes we're looking more and more. I think we're looking for. Uh, he didn't. He didn't say it exactly. So. But he did imply that, I mean, it all does go back to this dignity of the other person. If we're treating each other the way we want to be treated, uh, usually we're, we're probably advancing many of the political rights or the rights that are due us, right? Um, uh, as Cardinal O'Malley said, uh, not only do we have rights, but we have responsibilities and uh, we have duties towards the other. Um, that we have to not only insist on our own rights, but we have to then recognize those rights and honor those rights in other people. So just as we have a duty to, or we have a right to vote, we also have a duty. Right? We have an obligation to be engaged in the public square. Right? Because we have uh, uh, the duty to, or the right to educate our children, we have to fulfill that obligation. Right? That's a responsibility for us. What was the one we were talking about? Uh, we, have a, we have a right to get uh, honest news. Right? We have an obligation to do a little research on our, our own and to insist on our politi from our political leaders and even our news people that they are speaking the truth. Um, so all the rights that we have, uh, almost all of them, have a, uh, a responsibility that comes with them. Uh, that we have to um, fulfill. Otherwise, uh, we're not honoring those rights that God has, has given to us. So along with the, um, the rights of the individual, uh, the rights of the family, they have a right to exist and progress as a family. They have a right to exercise responsibility regarding the transmission of life and educate their children the right to the intimacy of conjugal and family life. We see sometimes in countries, it was at least in the policy of China a few years ago, one child, you get one, right? The church would say, well, that's a violation of family life to tell the family how many children they can have. Uh, it's a right of the family to believe in and profess one's faith and to propagate it. The right to bring children up according to your traditions, religious and cultural. The right, uh, especially of the sick, to uh, political, to obtain political, social security, housing for families. Again, some of the other rights that uh, would go along with, just like with the, with the individual. Uh, and the family then is, is meant to uh, participate in the social life of, of the community as well. Right? So, um, questions about that? We're getting to the end, so I'm ready for questions. I've got a question. Yes, Catherine Lee. <laughs> I think a lot of these are. You know, they sound really highfalutin. Right. And um, everybody, who doesn't want these rights? Right. Uh, and then we see how so many of these, this is such a treasure, this um, rights and responsibility, all of these Catholic social teachings. Um, I know that in North Minneapolis right now, um, people, who are, people are saying, I have the right to lead-free water. And so what's happening is the sub the subsidiarity of that community is getting together and they're taking care of each other's families. And they are saying, we are going to keep our leaders accountable until we can be sure that when we turn on the faucet, we get clean water because that's our right. Mm -hmm. So it is such an intimate thing. You know, sometimes I think we think of these things that were written 60 years ago, but it's really 
something that we encounter every day. And it's a great gift. Yep. Yeah, and that's, uh, I was trying to think of um, uh, other examples of that when you started that one, because there are, maybe it's just a neighborhood association. You know, we want to keep our neighborhood safe. Again, North Minneapolis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They want to keep their, their areas safe. And so, okay, let's, let's uh, join together and uh, so that our kids can stay safe. Again, we're trying to hold our leaders responsible. We know a police officer can't be on every corner, but we have a duty to protect our, our, our children as well, so that's something. We've got, uh, who else has an example of something subsidiary? Anything going on in White Bear? We got the people against the lead people across the street. People, our neighbors are up in arms, trying to band together because we want clean air, clean water. The water gremlin. Yep, the water gremlin, yep. You know, this idea of subsidiarity, we're seeing this play out in the Synod now, here in the Archdiocese, right? Mm -hmm. The Archbishop could say, and people have said, and, and some priests have said, Archbishop, just tell us what you want to do, and then we'll do it, right? This top-down model. Uh, but the Archbishop said, no, I want to hear what are the concerns of the people, right? Where, where do they want to go? Where do they see the issues? Is it with their children? Is it... Uh, the young people going away? Is it uh, the fact that people aren't believing in the Eucharist? Is it marriage? Whatever. The, the Archbishop wants to hear uh, what, are, what is on people's minds so that he can develop this strategic plan. He knows that the ideas for a lot of this are best here at the parish level. Right? Uh, the, the things that we're doing with mission uh, the things we're doing with outreach. These are things that uh, uh, we, we have some answers maybe for the larger church. And so, uh, po uh, po uh, he wouldn't want that. Archbishop uh, Hebda <laughs> wants to hear some of these things about what's going on at the local level. That's another example of the subsidiarity, right? Of listening, of engaging the Holy Spirit, right? Um, but that's a great, uh, that, that was a great example. Right, of course, we, we start this in the family. We have to teach our children and our grandchildren uh, what this means, who they are as a human being. We have to teach them um, that they have dignity, right? I was talking to a, a, a therapist today uh, because I had someone uh, call me trying to with, work with their young person and the young person, they couldn't get the young person in. They had to go an hour and a half to a different hospital. Why? Because all the beds in the mental health area are full of young people. What the heck is going on? Right? Where they've, have they lost their sense of dignity and their sense of, of who they are and, and that they're made in God's image and likeness and they have a destiny uh, that they are have been made lovingly and intentionally by God, right? The places are packed uh, as, as young people try to sort themselves out. We're, you know, where we, us adults, where, where, have we, where have we missed the boat on this, right? Uh, and how can we, maybe not looking at what we did wrong, but how can we help our young people just hammer this, uh, that, they're, that they have dignity just because they are. Right, and uh, so we have to do uh, a much better job with that because they, lots of them are just, they're languishing. We see, I saw an article of young people, especially young girls, you know, taking their lives. Why, they just don't have, uh, they don't sense a purpose in life, right? They have a great purpose, right? God's plan. Uh, we have to help them sort that out. Um, yeah, yeah. Don't get me going. We'll get on to another topic. <laughs> but this is, this is where the community, right, the human family, the parish family, needs to come to the aid of our young people and uh, encourage them when we see them at Mass. Hey, it's great, great that you're here. We see them uh, doing something at Mass. Hey, thank you for doing that. I did that when I was your age. 
60 years ago, 70 years ago, <laughs> 80 years ago, right? Yeah. Thank you for doing that. It's great to have you here. How's school going? To engage them, to, because often what I hear is, you know, we show up, eh, we're kind of overlooked. And so we want to encourage them uh, when we see them. At, well, we want to encourage them wherever we see them, but especially in church. Um, encourage the parents who are bringing their children. And you know what a struggle it can be sometimes. Um, but that's, that's our responsibility, right, as well, to encourage people. Questions? All right, um, remember we have dinner tonight, right now, uh, downstairs, free will offering. Uh, next week, we're gonna talk about option for the poor and vulnerable. That'll be a good one. And the dignity of work and the rights of workers. The church has spoken out on that often. Uh, uh, so that'll be our topic for next week. And next week is, um, don't get confused because we don't have faith formation next week because it's it's already um, MEA. So even though the kids aren't meeting for for faith formation, we'll be meeting.